Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Christmas time is here. Come on, let's stand up. We got a, we got a bunch of Christmas songs we're going to be singing this morning, some new and some old. But we're gonna just worship the Lord together as we uh, celebrate the coming of our King. Come on, let's worship together this morning. Shepherds came to see the baby stood by his mother's side. He laid the Savior inside a manger. Oh, what a glorious night! Oh, what a glorious night! I hear the angels singing. Shepherds wondered, they couldn't hide it, told everyone inside. All were amazed when they heard how God came down on the glorious night. God came down on this glorious night. I hear the angels sing. shining in the sky below in Bethlehem the king is sleeping oh what a glorious night oh what a glorious night You know what? Come on, let's sing it.
Amen. Good morning. This time we set aside to say welcome to Three Rivers Church. If you're visiting with us today, we're so glad to have you visiting with us. There's a communication card that you can find in the back of the chair in front of you. And uh, we'd encourage you to uh, fill that out and uh, so we can get, know, get to know you a little bit better, know how to connect with you. And if you would put those in the offering plate in the very back by that handsome fellow standing up back there, Mr. Bruce. Um, or you can put them in the uh, mail drop box. And uh, we also do not have the offering plates being passed for our tithes and offering. Haven't done that for a while. But amazingly, we are still giving in tithes and offering because we've settled in our hearts. Um, and we are cheerful givers as God des desires of us. Amen? Amen? Okay. If we, I hope so. Um, I love Christmas songs. I love the Christmas decorations, and I've heard for years that uh, sometimes we get so excited about this festive time that sometimes we have to remember that some people aren't excited. Uh, some people are the exact opposite because the, the festivity, the decorations, the traditions remind them of tough times or loss and things that are in their, in their lives. And I just want to share a couple things with you this morning. In our Sunday school class, our adult class, uh, there was an excerpt in there that said, too often we rush into God's presence carrying the dust of the world and its cares. Pausing to recognize his holiness, we must set aside everything that hinders our encounter with the Lord. I remind us often that we come here today and we're here for one reason, and that is to worship Jesus Christ. Uh, but what makes it difficult oftentimes is we bring in a lot of difficult things. And when I think about the, uh, the Christmas season, we were just singing in a little town of Bethlehem, and it said that in thy dark streets shineth. The streets can get really dark. Our lives can get really dark. But what shineth is the everlasting light the hopes and the fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. You see, what I am pushing through, I want to encourage others to push through, is it doesn't matter how difficult experience have been in this time of year because there is something that far exceeds that, and that is the reason that we celebrate it all. We may have forgotten and got too excited about the decorations, are too excited about their traditions but the excitement is in this do not be afraid i bring you good news that will cause you great joy for all the people today in the town of david a savior has been born to you he is the messiah the lord so it doesn't matter whether it's christmas eve christmas day or today, what allows us to push through the darkness is the light of Jesus Christ because we have given our lives to him. And he is the big deal. And we're here to worship him today. So whatever you've brought in with you, set it aside because we are worshiping together a holy God that has made a way for us to be reconciled to him forever. Amen? Father, we come before you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you that you are so patient and compassionate with us and the silliness of our feelings and emotion and the things that weighed us down. We push through that and we acknowledge that we have a Savior. He is Jesus Christ. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. And we are new creatures in him. And you have given us and called us to a life of hope and joy because of the good news we know and live and get to share. Lord, may we worship you rightly and properly today. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
how the hands of God could be so small. How tiny fingers are reaching in the night were the very hands that measure the sky.
So this morning, we, uh, we begin our four-week Christmas series where we will be looking at the Christmas story as told by different characters who were involved in the story. Now, as we go through this series, it leads us up to Christmas. Um, the telling of the events surrounding the birth of Jesus and the, the birth of Christ itself, it will be read about and it will be covered in this series, but that's not really the focus of our series this year. Yes, the, the Christmas story is wonderful. It's, it's encouraging and it brings joy to the hearts of those who love the Lord Jesus. It, it is the story of the greatest gift that's ever been given. When, when God demonstrated his great love for mankind by giving his one and only son, it's truly the greatest story ever told because without Christmas, there could be no crucifixion. Without the crucifixion, there could be no resurrection. And without the crucifixion and resurrection, there would be no hope for mankind. And so, Chris, the, the Christmas story is, is, a, is such a wonderful story, an, an amazing story that tells us the beginning of Emmanuel. You get that? Emmanuel means God with us. So, before Jesus came to the earth as that tiny little baby in a manger, he wasn't yet Emmanuel. Yes, God, Jesus is the second part of the Godhead. Yes, he, he was the creator of all things. John's gospel spells that out for us, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That, that he was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. That, that's the first three verses of the book of John. So it's clear that Jesus was there from even before the beginning and that he is intimately involved in the creation of the universe. Jesus is God. And there are many, many titles and characteristics of Jesus that preceded his coming to the earth. But in order for Jesus to become Emmanuel, in order for him to become God with us, he had to come and be with us. And that's what Christmas is all about. That that's what we celebrate and remember this time of year. That the, the, the coming of God in the flesh, God taking upon himself humanity so that he could rescue us from the penalty of our sin. You, you want to know why I love Christmas so much? You, you want to know why I listen to Christmas music all year? Why, why I am so thrilled to see the day after Thanksgiving finally appear where it's socially acceptable for me to be festive and listen to all the songs and all that, that, I've, that I've been listening to all year anyway, and why I'm so bummed come December the 26th when everybody starts immediately taking down all their Christmas decorations and getting ready for the new year. Here's why. Christmas is such a wonderful, beautiful reminder of God's amazing, extravagant love. Christmas is where I can see the depths of, of how far my God was willing to go to, 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 to save my wretched, pathetic soul. That, that, that he would, God would send his son to this earth so that he could take the penalty of my sin away. So, so, that, so that I could have eternal life and a home with him one day forever in his heaven. Excuse me if I want to celebrate that for more than just three or four weeks out of the years. Oh, what a wonderful time Christmas truly is. I love the story. It never gets old to me. Even though I have read these verses hundreds of times, I never grow tired of it. But in this series, the, fo the focus isn't so much on the events that took place that we're all so familiar with. It's on what the folks who were involved in the events had to say about it. What their take was as participants in this story. And so, 
The title for this series is The Story of Christmas According to or From the People in Luke's Gospel. And, and, and with that said, I must give a little caveat. Uh, not all of the people in this series are actually people. In, in two weeks, the, the people for that week is actually going to be angels. So I guess I could have called it from the characters in Luke's Gospel, but, but here we are. But let me go ahead and ask, do you have your Bible this morning? Good. Please open it if you haven't already to Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, where we will be reading verses 39 through 56. That's the book of Luke, chapter 1, beginning at verse 39. And as we start this series today, the first person that we're going to hear from is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, we're going to be reading at verse 39, begin reading at verse 39 for context purposes, but the, but the focus of our message today is going to be on verses 46 through 55 on Mary's song, all right? Are you there? All right, pre please look and read along with me. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 39. Now, this time Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, here we go, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble estate of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servants, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And then Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. Would you pray with me? Father, as we look in on this scene, Lord, I, I just pray that you would guide our time together this morning. That we would uh, try to place ourselves in the shoes of Mary, if, if there be any way we can do that, and, and where she is and what she has experienced and then what is before her and her reaction to the message that you sent to her through her angel, your angel. God, I, we, we just want to really understand what is going on in this scene and how wonderful it is uh, as, we, as we celebrate and remember Christmas, the coming of our Savior to this world. Lord, uh, these, these people that we're going to be looking at through these series were there when it happened. Lord, we look back remembering things that we've heard and read. But Lord, these, these were the eyewitnesses. These were the people who were actually involved. So Lord, help us to, to learn from them, from their perspective so that we can better understand what a glorious night it truly was when Christ came to this world. Have your way, and we'll thank you for all that you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do we have any old school country music fans here? You know, when I was a kid growing up, that was what my parents listened to on the radio, country music. You know, Dolly Parton, Kenny Rogers, the Oak Ridge Boys, George Jones, that sort. You know, and, and that's what I grew up listening to. And of course, as the years went by, new artists came along, artists that are now old country singers themselves. But back in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, you know, these guys were the newcomers. 
Well, there was one such artist who came along in the late 80s whose name was Travis Tritt. Anybody familiar with Travis Tritt? Anybody heard that name? Uh, Travis was, was like, just like most singers who eventually hit the big time, they got their start in the small circuit. They have to start off in the small time, you know, playing anywhere that they could get an opportunity. An opportunity. And Travis found himself often playing in some rough and sketchy places. Uh, but as I say, you've you got to pay your dues. Well, well, a number of years ago in an interview, Travis told a story of a time when he was playing in one of those, let's say, less than desirable places to play. And while he was there playing, a bar fight broke out. Imagine that. A fight in a bar. But, but trying to find a way to stop the fight and ease the tension in the room, he had this idea. I don't know why he came up with this idea, but he came up with an idea, and it worked. In fact, it worked so well that it became his go-to practice every time he was playing somewhere and a fight was beginning to get riled up. And it worked over and over again. What was it that he did? Listen to what Travis Tritt said in, an, in, in, in the interview. He said, just when things started to get out of hand, when bikers were reaching for their pool, pool cues and rednecks were headed out to their trucks for their gun rack, I'd start play, playing Silent Night. It could be in the middle of July. I didn't care. And he said that as he played that song, those grown and rough men would stop and look at him in confusion. I mean, who expects to hear Silent Night being played in a bar? Right? So they'd look at him in confusion, but you know what? They'd calm down. And it worked over and over again. There's, there's just something about Christmas carols. There's something about the songs that talk about the birth of Jesus that stirs the heart of most people. So, so the singing of that old Christmas carol has worked for Travis Tritt for many years to calm a lot of people but what about the very first Christmas carol? How has it affected people throughout the years? Well, you might ask, what is the very first Christmas carol? I'm glad you asked. It's found here in our text today. It's the Song of Mary that starts in verse 46. These words of adoration and worship and wonder. They, they, they pour out of Mary in a moment of instantaneous praise. And they are so beautiful, so full of truth. They're full of Old Testament references that come from both the Psalms and from Hannah's song of praise in, in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And so what we can see here in Mary's words in Luke 1 by her, her echoing the words from Psalms and from 1 Samuel, what we can see from Mary is that she knew the Scriptures. Mary had hidden the words of God on her heart. And when an occasion occurred for, for, for her to bless the Lord and praise His wonderful name, she did so using the very words of God Himself, singing, singing them back to Him from what she had written on the tablet of her heart. The Song of Mary has become known as the Magnificent. Your Bible probably has has it labeled that way just before verse 46. Most Bibles do, the Magnificent. Why this title? Why the Magnificent? Well, it's because of the first line of Mary's song which says, my soul exalts the Lord. Or some translations say, my soul glorifies the Lord. Some say, my soul magnifies the Lord. Whatever translation you may be reading, it will have some rendering of this statement. And they all mean the same thing, to make great, to praise, to revere. And the Latin term for this word is, guess what? Magnificent. And so, and so that's where the title to Mary's song comes from. It's from the Latin word, which means to magnify the Lord. And so this is how she begins her song. 
My soul exalts the Lord. It was Mary's greatest desire to magnify the Lord, not herself. Mary had no intention or desire to bring attention to herself, to make herself known, to set herself apart. uh, she, She wanted all the attention on the Lord her God. And here in her song, Mary uses the phrase, He has, six times. She uses the word, Lord, God, my Savior, the Mighty One. And in these 10 verses, Mary uses the words, He, His, or Him, a total of 14 times. So who is it that Mary's full attention is on? Who is it that Mary wants to make known, that she wants to praise, that she wants to magnify in this song? It's the Lord. He. As we we read the words of Mary here in Luke 1, It's important that we remember to set the stage. It's important that we remember who and what she was and the culture in which she lived. Mary was an unmarried, teenage, peasant girl who had just found out that she was pregnant. An unwed mother was a big no-no in those days. It wasn't just looked down on. It wasn't just frowned at. No, in that culture, you could and most likely would be put to death, stoned in the street in that day. So can can you imagine the fear that Mary had to wrestle with when she received the news from the angel that she was with child. How am I going to explain this? But but, but instead of giving in to fear and worry and dread, Mary trusted God. And she blessed his name and she broke forth in this song of praise. And you know, most young teenage girls, unwed teenage girls, if they find out they're pregnant, they usually don't burst out in song. But, but Mary was different. Mary was, was very different. And not only was, was Mary different, but more importantly, the child that she carried was different. This child was different than any other child that had been or ever would be born. And Mary had just been told by the angel of God that that she had been chosen by God to be the mother of God's own son. No pressure, Mary. I mean, can can you even begin to imagine? Think about it, ladies. Imagine you're a 13-ish year old girl. You're nobody from nowhere. And all of a sudden, an angel appears to you and delivers to you the message that you're pregnant and that you have been given the responsibility to raise the Son of God. Put yourself in those shoes. You know, when, when the angel first appeared to her, he said, do not be afraid, Mary. And I understand why. Being in the presence of an angel is a terrifying thing for mortal men. There, there's, there's a reason why an angel's standard greeting in the scriptures begins with the words, do not be afraid. Uh, angels are magnificent creatures who whose countenance carries the glory of God. And, and I don't have time to, to get into that today. Maybe Mark will cover that in a couple of weeks, cover some of that in a couple of weeks when, when he talks about the angels. Or, or maybe we can look at the angels sometimes down the road. But, uh, but, 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 but angels are magnificent creatures who, who their, their, their appearance strikes fear into the heart of mortal men. So I understand why the angel appeared to Mary with the words, do not be afraid. But you know, I think that those same words would have also been a very fitting conclusion to his message as well. 
after being told that she was going to be the mother of the Son of God, that she was going to be responsible to raise and nurture the Son of God, I think it would have been very fitting for the angel to depart speaking the same words with which he appeared. Don't be afraid, Mary. The Lord is with you. But, but what a glimpse we get into the character and nature of this young Jewish girl as we read the words of her song here in Luke 1. Look with me at the first five verses of the Magnificent. Start at start there at verse 46. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble, humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. Mary begins... Her, her song by, by recounting the goodness of God, telling of, of his amazing and, and undeserved grace. And notice how she refers to God as my Savior there in verse 47. That's, that's significant. It tells us of Mary's understanding of who and what she was. Only sinners need a Savior, right? And so, with Mary using these particular words, we can see that that Mary knew what she was. She didn't see herself as somebody better. She didn't see herself as an imperfect person. Rather, Mary knew that she was, was a girl with flaws and faults and sin, a person who, who needed to be rescued. You know, just, just a little while ago, we, we sang that song, Mary, Did You Know? Let me just go ahead and answer the question. Yes, she did. Mary knew. Uh, the, the angel told her exactly who it was that she was going to give birth to. Now, of course, she couldn't. There, there's no way she could know all the details of how all the things were going to play out through the course of his life. But she did know that her child was the great I Am. She knew that. And, and, and something else that she knew, something else is questioned in that song. At the end of the first verse, it, it asked the question, did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you've delivered will soon deliver you. Yes, uh, according to what we can see here in Luke 147, Mary knew this. She knew this well. She understood that she was a sinner who needed saving and that God was the source of her salvation through this child that she was carrying. And just, again, try to put yourself in Mary's shoes and wrap your mind around this. You know, the, the, the last song we sang, there, there's a line in there that said something you know, along the lines of uh, Mary had to rock her Savior to sleep. And, and in verse 48, Mary continues to acknowledge her unworthiness and, and the blessing that, that, that that she had received, saying in, in verse 48, For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. God has looked upon me, and he's blessed me. I don't know why. I can't explain it. I don't deserve it. But the Lord, in his amazing and infinite mercy and grace, he has looked down on, on my humble state, and he has blessed his bondservant. Mary understood how insignificant she was in the world's eyes. And she understood how small and powerless and undeserving she was before an almighty God. And her words here show us this. She felt totally unworthy to even be seen by God, much less chosen by him. Mary was just another poor Jewish girl 
one among thousands of poor Jew Jewish girls. But more than that, Mary was from all places Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was not a desirable place to be from. Nazareth was, was, a, was just a poor, little-known place. In fact, Nazareth was mostly unheard of outside of the Jewish people. Only people with part of the nation of Israel even knew about this place for the most part. It was off the beaten path. It was, it was a little obscure place, a place that was looked down on by all the other Jews. It's a town that is not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament. And it only appears in the New Testament because that's where Mary and Joseph were from and incidentally where they would return and raise Jesus. But if it weren't for that, it's likely that the scriptures would never have mentioned this obscure little town at all. And, and all the other people, you know, all those proper Jews, they all looked down on folks from Nazareth. People from Nazareth were thought to be unrefined, uneducated, ignorant, and crude. And that's why in John 1, when Philip is told that they had found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, when Philip heard that message, his knee-jerk reaction was to exclaim, Nazareth, can, 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 can anything good come from Nazareth? So understand that Nazareth was, was not a place that you bragged about being from. It was, it was a place that you tried to keep people from knowing you were from. So put yourself in Mary's shoes here in Luke 1. She is literally nobody from nowhere. She's just one of thousands of poor Jewish girls and then one who would have been considered by all the rest of the nation of Israel as the least of all the thousands of poor Jewish girls. So why, why would God choose her? Because that's exactly what God does. 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verses 27 through 20, 29 says, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring nothing to things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Th this is what God does. He does the opposite of what man would do. He uses the things that make no sense to us. But why? He does it so that when it's all said and done, only he can get the credit for it. And Mary, here in Luke 1, she sees this truth being played out in her own life. She sees how God does the opposite of what, what man would do because she, she thinks that she, of all people, is the least qualified, least deserving choice that God could possibly make. In the movie, The Nativity Story, which, which I highly recommend, by the way, but in that movie, there's a scene where Mary, she has gone to visit her cousin Elizabeth, where, where, we, have, where our, we started reading today. Mary had gone to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And while she's there, Mary and Elizabeth are sitting there talking. And in the conversation, Mary asked the question, Elizabeth, why is it me that God has asked? I am nothing. You know, I think that's precisely why God chose Mary. Because there was no pride, no arrogance, no sense of entitlement. God looked upon Mary and saw a humble, unassuming, obedient servant, and he said, that's the one. Church, you want to make God happy? You want God to use you to in do incredible and unimaginable things? Here's the starting point. Debase yourself. Humble yourself. Give no thought to self. 
I mean, think about it. What, what did King David do? It says that he danced before the Lord through the streets of Jerusalem, making a total fool of himself before the people. And when his wife came to ridicule him about it, what did David say? You ain't seen nothing yet. I'll become even more indignified than that. What about John the Baptist? Now John, John had a large group of followers, a bunch of disciples that followed him. But what did John the Baptist do? He pointed them all to Jesus. He pointed to Jesus and saying that he's the one. That guy right there, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Y'all need to follow him. Y'all need to go after him. I must decrease, he must increase. By the way, Jesus, speaking of John the Baptist, Jesus said that there's never been one greater born among women than John the Baptist. That's a huge statement coming from the mouth of the Lord. What John said, I must decrease, he must increase. Follow him. What about the Apostle Paul? In, in, in 1 Timothy, Paul acknowledged that he was the chief of sinners. In Ephesians 3.8, he calls himself the very least of all the saints. In 1 Corinthians 15.9, Paul said that he was the least of the apostles and even unfit to be called an apostle. Now this is the guy who wrote half of the New Testament. This is the guy who is widely considered to be the greatest Christian of all time. But what was his opinion of himself? I am the least of all the saints. I am the least of the apostles. I am completely unfit to even be an apostle. And, and hey, what about Jesus? Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8, in describing the Lord Jesus, Philippians says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus emptied himself. He became a bond slave. He humbled himself and was obedient, obedient to the point that he willingly died the most brutal death that man could ever devise. And what happened because of that? Continuing on from Philippians 2 verse 9, it says, for this reason also, Jesus emptied himself, made himself humble, took on the form of a bondservant, and he, he willingly died in obedience to his father. For this reason, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow under heaven and on the earth, uh, in the heavens and on the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And what did Jesus say about himself in Matthew 20, verse 8? The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. You, you want to really please God? You, you, you want God to use you in incredible and unimaginable ways? Start here. Debase yourself. Think little of yourself. Humble yourself. Strip yourself of all pride and arrogance and self-worth and learn to live your life in service of all others. And once you have reached that place, once you have come to the place in your life where you have the same attitude as all of those guys that I just talked about, well, once you have come to the place where you have the same attitude as Mary, the mother of Jesus, where you, where you truly understand that you are utterly unworthy and, and the sincere question of your heart becomes, God, why would you want me? I am nothing. I have absolutely nothing to offer. When we reach that place, it's then that we become a vessel that God can use to do crazy, unbelievable, world-shaking things. That's the people God uses. You know, if you walk into a business, some business, or walk into a school or, or, or some big building, and you, 
see a guy walking by and he's got this giant key ring hanging from his belt who would you instantly know that guy was the janitor or, or, or the custodian as they're sometimes called right it, it, it would just be natural to assume that the person with all the keys to all the places in, on the premises was the janitor they, they, they've got access to everything how interesting is it that the person who is typically viewed as the lowest person in the place has the most keys but the keys come by serving in the same way you don't gain keys in God's kingdom by climbing up you gain keys by bowing down you find keys in servanthood if you're in an office building and you walk into any room in that place and you find the janitor there you never ask what are you doing in here people don't ask the janitor what, what they are doing in a room because they already know he's working, he's serving, he's taking out the trash, he's sweeping the floor he's changing the light, he's fixing something that's broken, the janitor has all kinds of responsibilities and all of those responsibilities are jobs of service to others, jobs, they're, they're tasks that makes things better and easier for others that's what janitors do they serve and so people don't walk into a room, no matter what the room is. It could be the president's office. It doesn't matter. Folks don't walk into the room and ask the janitor, what are you doing here? Why? Because his job of serving gives him access. Remember what I just shared with you about what Jesus said about himself in Matthew chapter 20. I want to read it to you again, but this time I want to start a couple of verses earlier back in verse 25 so that we can see the whole context of what Jesus was saying listen to this this is Matthew 20 verses 25 through 28 but Jesus called them to himself and said you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, over them and their great men exercise authority over them it is not this way among you but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. When God spoke, I mean, when God, when God looked upon Mary, he saw a humble, unassuming, obedient servant and that was exactly the qualities that he desired for the mother of his son to have. So God chose her, and he blessed her, and he entrusted her with the care of his son. But Mary, Mary was very much aware of the fact that she was unworthy. Mary understood that she was the last person that men would have chosen. And so she cries out in her song of praise, saying in verse 48, For he has regard for, had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me as blessed. For, for the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who have fear in him. Mary, Mary exclaims that, God's mercy is upon generation after generation to those who fear him. This is a reciting of the words of Psalm 103, 17. And the whole psalm of Psalm 103 is a song that's all about the undeserved mercy of God. That, that, that psalm begins with the words, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And Mary, she recites from this psalm, and she, she's praising God, and she gives thanks to him for, for not only for, for what she, not only giving her what, not, for not only not giving her what she deserved, but for the mercy and love and grace that he has shown, for, for withholding from her what she did deserve, just like he does for all who fear him. That's the 
undeserved grace of God. And, and saying that is really a redundant statement because grace, by its very de definition, is undeserved. Grace is just something you don't deserve to get. But what we see in the first four verses of Mary's song is that God loves the underdog. God is the champion of the weak and the feeble. He, he, he chooses the ordinary. He, he embraces the unimpressive. And that's exactly what Mary's was, Mary was, according to the world's standards anyway. She was the weak, the ordinary, the unimpressive. And as the angel came to her that day with this unbelievable, unimaginable, extraordinary news, she knew she was fully aware that she was unworthy, that she was just like all of us, a sinful human being who was in desperate need of a Savior. So she's amazed. She's amazed that God, who knew everything about her, all of her flaws, all of her failures, all of her shortcomings, God knew everything about her, but he chose her anyway. She's amazed by this, and, and so am I. As, as, as I stand here before you today, I am fully aware of who and what I am. I am fully aware of how undeserving I am to be loved and accepted and forgiven by a holy God, much less be used by him to do anything. So, so, oh, how I can relate to Mary's words here in verses 49 and 50. Look at those words again. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. Now look at verse 51. She goes on saying, he has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, and he has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, and he has sent away the rich empty-handed. And in these verses, Mary speaks of God's unmatched power and his sovereign reign over all things. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He scatters the proud. He brings down rulers from their thrones. He exalts the humble, but, and, and, and he fills the hungry with good things, but, but he sends away the rich empty. What does all this mean? Again, it means that God does things exactly opposite of how the world does things. He flips it all upside down. All of the stuff that this world holds dear, power, prestige, fame, and fortune, God's not impressed by any of that. And the truth is, no, no matter how much stuff you have, no matter how safe and secure you may feel, God can take it all away in an instant. It can be gone. Verse 51 speaks, speaks of the strength of God's arm. And as I read that, I think back to when I was a small child, and, and I would challenge my grandfather to an arm wrestling match. Now, thinking back, this had to be a pitiful yet hilarious sight. Uh, my pathetic little scrawny self with my little hand engulfed, and I mean I'd put it up there and he'd wrap his hand around mine and it would completely disappear if Papa would wrap his hand around my little hand. And I'd even use both hands, right? I'm pulling and tugging. I'm using everything I've got, all my body weight, and I still couldn't budge him. My grandfather was a man's man. He worked his whole life on the farm. He had those big Popeye-like forearms. I mean, strong. Unbelievably strong. And then there was my little dumb self, Come on, let's arm wrestle. Right? And he'd play with me. Uh, he'd give a little, and he'd let me pull his arm down. He'd just, 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 just toying with me. And then I'd get so excited thinking, one of these days I'm actually going to get him. I'm fi finally going to get him. But then, almost completely effort effortlessly, he would tighten his arm and just roll me over like I wasn't nothing. But re really, I was nothing in comparison to him. You know, as 
I look around the world today where we have athletes and coaches making obscene amounts of money. I mean, Jimbo Fisher just got paid $76 million to get fired from Texas A&M. We've got haughty business executives and self-absorbed celebrities, prideful politicians. There, there's all of these people with power and prestige and position and wealth and also enormous amounts of pride and arrogance and a bloated sense of self-work. And so many of them have, in a sense, challenged God to an arm wrestling match. And they don't have a clue just how foolish and dumb they look they're 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 pulling and they're and they're tugging with all the strength they can they can possibly muster up they're using all their body weight and all the while they're blind to the fact that god at any moment god can just tighten up his arm and send them flying but understand please please don't miss this it's not just the rich and powerful who get caught in this trap it's all of us. I, any of us can fall into the trap of chasing after the temporary comforts and conveniences and riches of the world. Don't fall for the lie. Chasing after the stuff of this world will never satisfy. Only Jesus can satisfy the deepest longing of your soul. So, you know, if you've been dealt a crummy hand in this life, if, if things are hard and, and you don't know what to do or well, where, where to turn, if you feel that you are fresh out of options this morning, let me, let me tell you what to do. Come to Jesus. Bring it to Jesus. Bring your case before the righteous judge. Enter into the throne room of the mighty king. Turn all of your worries over to him, all of your concerns, all of your troubles. Bring it all to him. Place your full trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and rest in him. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Come to me, all you who are burdened and weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn for me for I am gentle and humble at heart and, and I will and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light the old hymn says Jesus knows all about our struggles he will guide till the day is done there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus no not one no not one don't let this world influence you to chase after the stuff that's all just going to burn up in the fire of God's judgment. Don't fret over which political party is in control or who the next president is going to be. Don't, don't, don't lose sleep over concerns for tomorrow. King Jesus is already there. Let, let the song of Mary be, be a comfort to you. See, God, God's letting the powerful people of the world run the show right now, and they are pulling with all their might against his arm. But one day he will say, that's enough, and he will show the whole world just who he is, just how mighty his arm really is as he brings to ruin all the kingdoms and powers of this world. He will exalt the humble. And fill the hungry with good things. Mary has spent her whole life waiting. She's been looking forward to the day when God would send the promised Messiah. She's been waiting for the hope of Israel, but not, not just the hope of Israel, the hope of the whole world. And she's, she's been waiting for to, him to appear just like all the nation of Israel had. But she never, not even in her wildest dreams, could she ever have imagined that God would choose her as the vessel through which he would send the Savior. But now, here she is, stunned, stunned in amazement and wonder. She's singing the song of praise, a song of adoration and thanksgiving to God for what he has done and what he was going to do. And what is it that God was going to do? Look at verse 54. He has given help 
to Israel his servant in remembrance of his mercy. And he has spoke, as he has spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. God will fulfill his promise. Mary remembers the covenant that God had made with Abraham and his descendants, rejoicing in the promise that this covenant has no expiration date. What does she say there at the end of verse 55? As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants, for how long? Forever. That's the emphatic final word of Mary's song, forever. And that word is the anthem of God's love throughout the scriptures. Just, just, just go read Psalm 136. Psalm 136 begins, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his love endures forever. And following that opening statement, Psalm 136 goes on to say 25 more times, his love endures forever. Psalm, I mean, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, it says that the grass withers and the flower faith but the word of God endures forever Hebrews 13 8 Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever forever when you place your faith in Christ Jesus the Lord you are secure for how long forever that is the promise of God that is the emphatic final word of Mary's song forever Mary, Mary understood just how massive this message, message that she had just received was. She, she understood that, that through the child that she carried, God was going to fulfill his promise and change the course of not just her life through this child, but, but, but God was going to change the course of the world through this child. And so, moved by amazement and all and thanksgiving Mary sings this song of praise to God her Savior I heard a story once of a man who one day he decided that every time he got paid he was going to take $20 from his paycheck and he was going to hide it under his bed and so he, that's what he started doing he didn't tell anybody about it he just started tucking $20 away, and he, and he did this for years, storing up for himself quite a significant stash of money over, over the years. Well, as the man got older, he got sick, and he knew that he was approaching the end of his life. So just, just before he died, he told his wife about the money, and he asked his wife to make him a promise. His dying wish was that when he died, that his wife would take all of that money and put it in his casket so that he could take it with him. Well, the man died. And his wife, keeping her promise, she went and she gathered up all the money. She went and put it in the bank and then wrote a check and put the check in her husband's casket. <laughs> What's my point? There are far too many people in this world who write checks to God that they never have any intention of cashing. Folks who make commitments and then give no second thought about bailing out. People who make promises with no intention of keeping them. But do you know there's never been one single promise that God has broken. No matter how we treat him, no matter how unfaithful we are, no matter how many promises we break, how many times we don't keep our word, everything that God has said has already or will come to pass. God never, ever breaks his word, and every promise he has made will be kept. When, when Christ came, the people had been waiting for hundreds of years for God's promise to be fulfilled. And I'm sure that there were some, if not many, who had given up hope that he was ever actually going to appear. I mean, it's been hundreds and hundreds of years. 
Many refuse, and many still refuse, to believe that Jesus is the promised one of God. And that's why John 1, verses 11 and 12 says that he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become the children of God. So Mary understood just just how huge this was. Although it made no sense to her that God would choose her, although I'm sure that she had doubts and concerns and fears, she trusted God and she rejoiced in his salvation. And so this is our first message in our Christmas series, a, a look into the story of Christmas from the perspective of Mary, I'm listening in on her song of praise, a song about God's grace and about, about God's power, a song about God's goodness, a song all about God, about what God has done and about what God is going to do. Mary's focus is completely on God and his goodness, but in the middle of this song that is all about God, we can also see something about Mary. Mary was a woman of great faith. She was a woman who believed in and trusted God's promise. Even though it made no earthly sense, Mary held to her faith and her trust in God, knowing that he cannot fail. So let that be the lesson for all of us as we journey through this world of doubts, this world of confusion, this world where things often just don't make any sense to us, let's learn to be like Mary and let's have unwavering faith in the Lord our God. Pray with me, Father. Thank you for our time together today. Thank you for the wonderful, wonderful story of Jesus and his love the love that you demonstrated to us by sending your son. And Lord, um, even though uh, as Christmas messages are preached all around the world and, and John 3.16 is usually not one that is very often used for a Christmas message, God, John 3.16 sums up what Christmas is all about, that God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is what Christmas is all about. You sending your son, a God coming in the flesh so that we could be saved from our sin. So God, help us to remember that, to celebrate that, rejoice in that today and throughout the season and throughout the year. Lord, help us to just have a spirit of Christmas celebration all the year long, all the years long, God, never, never forgetting what you have done for us. Thank you for, for the words of Mary, the encouragement that she gives, that, Lord, um, the, the, the example that she sets for us as she, she receives confusing, got to be terrifying news. But Lord, in the middle of the fear and the doubts and the concerns and the worries and whatever other emotions she may have been feeling in that moment, she didn't panic. She held to her faith. She held to her confidence in you. God, teach us and help us to be just like her. God, I thank you for our time together today. Lord, bless us. Keep us in the center of your will. Have your way through us. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, come, all you unfaithful, come. Weak and unstable, come, know you are not alone. Oh, come, barren and waiting ones, weary of praying, come, see what your God has done. Christ is born, Christ is born, 
Christ is born for you. Oh, come, bitter and broken, come with peers and spoken, come taste of his perfect love. Oh, come, guilty and hiding once, there is no need to run, see what your God has done. Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born for you. He's the Lamb who was given, slain for our pardon. His promise is peace for those who believe. He's the Lamb who was given, slain for our pardon. His promise is peace. For those who believe, so come, though you have nothing, come, he is the offering, come, see what your God has done, Christ is born, Christ is born. Christ is born for you. Christ is born. Christ is born. Christ is born for you. Amen. Thank you, Becky. Go ahead and have a seat. Just a pile of announcements. Our Lottie Moon Christmas offering runs from today through next Sunday. So if you want to give to that, there are special envelopes in the back just for that. Our proposed 2024 budget is posted on the bulletin board out that direction. There is also a 2023 budget so that you compare, uh, can compare year to year. Uh, just so that you know, uh, the price of everything is going up. Uh, our insurance uh, went up by $2,000 uh, for the year and uh, so did our electricity. So just, uh, if you have any questions on that, please uh, email me or shoot me a text or see me and I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Uh, if you want one sent to you uh, so that you can look more carefully, just shoot me an email and we'll get that in your hands. Our Three Rivers Annual Children's Christmas Party is next Saturday morning from 10 until noon. That is for ages three and up who must be potty trained. Our youth are having their Christmas party on Saturday, the December the 9th, from 5 until 8. There will be hors d'oeuvres served. There will be no hors d'oeuvres at the children's party, but uh, you should bring a book, right? They're having finger food, but that's different than hors d'oeuvres. Hors d'oeuvres are fancy. Finger food are not. So that's for the kids that uh, youth is Saturday night, kids is Saturday morning, and then our children's Christmas choir performance will be next Sunday night, December the 10th, at six o'clock. We're asking that you bring a finger food to share. Also, not fancy, so bring finger food. And then next Tuesday is mom to mom on the 12th, and then our men's prayer breakfast on the 16th. So as you can see, December is always very, very busy at Three Rivers, so all of the information you need is found right here in your current. So anything that you need more information, check out the current. Also, Miss Sally was voted the best artist for her watercolors for the month of December. That's pretty exciting. She was in the paper, so that is uh, pretty, pretty cool. So congratulations on that. Uh, let's stand. We'll be dismissed.
Tis the season to wear Christmas shirts and Christmas ties. I have one Christmas tie that Carrie got for me last year, so you don't even remember getting it. However, I do also, I have lots of Christmas socks. If, uh, and they'll match my socks. Well, it'll, be, uh, it'll be great fun. We're not having jammy Sunday, though, so just forget about Christmas jammies. I think, though, the kids might do that. Uh, not this year. New jammies. Tuxedos for the children's Christmas party. <laughs> then we might want to have hors d'oeuvres if we're going to have tuxedos. Probably no, tu- no tuxedos. So uh, a lot of stuff going on in December. Pay attention to everything that's going on. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful, Lord, as we start our Christmas series. Lord, grateful for the song of Mary. Lord, she did know that the child that she carried would be the Savior. Lord, we know she couldn't possibly have comprehended such an incredible, incredible truth that the angels told her. So Lord, help us to, as this Christmas season, Lord, help us to, to look at it with a renewed sense of passion, just a renewed interest. Lord, open our hearts and our minds for this Christmas season. Lord, give us every opportunity to share the truth of our Savior who was born in that little town of Bethlehem. Lord, I pray as always we'd be doers of God's word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen.